geregeld krijg ik allemaal mailtjes in mijn inbox van alle mailinglists. En sommige van die mailtjes zijn er ook uh, status reports, quarterly status reports, uh, waarin mensen hun updates kunnen presenteren. Tot mijn verbazing zag ik een hele tijd geleden aan één keer de naam Willem-Jan Withagen tussen staan, een persoon die ik uh, buiten freebies die ook, uh, ook wel ken. Uh, hij was namelijk aan het werken aan een uh, poort van Ceph, storage systeem, naar FreeBSD. Ik wil natuurlijk helemaal niks spoilen, dus ik geef denk ik mooi meteen het woord aan hem. Veel plezier. Hij staat uit. Ja, nu staat hij aan. Nu hoor ik het zelf ook. Oké. If you don't mind, I'm going to do the talk in English because uh, I did one presentation at Seven English and that got recorded and that's about the only thing on 3BSD and Seven combination. So I'd like to do this one in English as well, unless there's objection from Dutch speaking uh, cryptocysts that only want to speak Dutch. No rejections? Okay, right. Uh, I'm going to tempt uh, Murphy, which means that I'm going to do a live demo and that requires a cluster. Uh, to boot the cluster, or actually to in fully install the cluster in six jails and all kit and caboodle takes about 10 minutes. I don't know jokes for 10 minutes, so I'm now going to start the cluster and hope that it's done by the time we actually get to the demo. Uh, Right, okay, yes, off it goes. So we'll see by the time we get there whether we actually have a working cluster. Nah. I do have to apologize for using Windows, but it's only a, a method of using a desktop, which now is giving me a hard time. F5 doesn't work in this case, so I'll have to sh kill it and start it again. Uh, yes, here it is. Okay. Uh, porting Ceph to FreeBSD. I'll first introduce myself a little bit. I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, my history with storage that goes 35 years back all, all together. I'll explain to you why I'm a FreeBSD uh, fan and uh, why I think uh, FreeBSD needs something like Ceph. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about porting. If you have more questions about porting, please feel free. I think the first port I ever did was on an Apollo domain system. We ported uh, a browser, uh, the, the very first browser in the, in the end 80s. Uh, to Apollo domain, which was a problem because it's Unix, but it's not Unix. It's sort of like Linux, but it, it's, it's not Unix. Um, and then I'll give a, a, a live demo, and live demos are always dangerous. I'm an electrical engineer from the university. I studied in the 80s. In the 80s, it's like Apple I, Apple II, 10 dt rs 80 uh, CPM, the really the, 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 the start of our computing area. Uh, area. Uh, after that, I worked at Philips. So all the systems that you find now in history archives and Walter had on his attic uh, collected as, as really old historic systems is all the th things I toyed with. Uh, at the university, we got internet. I helped the university connect to the internet in 85. Uh, lots of friends in the university really wanted internet, so I started supplying from the group where I was working to give them accounts and things like that. That sort of got out of hand, and in 93, together with Guido, uh, more or less, we started the second ISP in the Netherlands, and that was called EIA. Anybody from Eindhoven here? Some of them probably uh, were customers of ours. Uh, that company got sold in 2000, April 4th, to an American company. It's, it's a date I will never forget because it's the day the stock exchange in the Netherlands actually plummeted. 
and I was selling my uh, company, and the guy who was buying the company had his phone with uh, a text messaging service from the stock exchange in London, and it went like tong 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 just for about an hour. And he said, I don't want to know. It's either good or it's bad. I'll find out tonight. So we had dinner in the evening, and I asked him, and he said, well, stock market just plummeted 17% on that day. So it's a, for, my, for me, it's a commemorable day for two reasons. I sold the company, and we had the internet bubble at that, uh, at that day. So uh, that company, we started with FreeBSD because Guido brought FreeBSD 1.0 on a CD, Linux was still somewhere in its infancy, 0.84 or 0.76 or something. Networking stack was still crap. So this was a Unix system, so we decided to start using FreeBSD. And I've never left FreeBSD in that respect, in that I know how Linux works, and if I need to boot and run a Linux system, I'll be able to do that, but I'd prefer you'd, you'd give me some FreeBSD. In, a, in 2000, we went on and, oh, why do we have that over there? Okay, thank you. Uh, and since then, I've founded quite a lot of, uh, let's say, IT-related re companies, and I have to admit that just about in every of those companies, we use Linux instead of FreeBSD, mainly because the people we employ, they know a lot more about uh, Linux, and Linux is... Uh, for them more standard than FreeBSD. I, however, got left behind in 2000 with FreeBSD. So, okay. Currently, I own a few companies. Uh, I'm a data center owner and manager. We run a cloud company which runs on Linux, OpenStack, and Ceph. Uh, my wife has a web design bureau uh, or business which runs on FreeBSD in this case, because I'm also the, the systems manager over there. And VNotion is a, is, is a startup company from the Eindhoven University where they do a lot of object uh, uh, recognition stuff. So why am I interested in Ceph at all? Uh, probably because storage has always fascinated me. And it starts more or less with this, I home built my first TGRS 80 from Tendi. It was a Z80 computer. It had like, I think, 2K of memory. And uh, it started out with a, really a cassette player where you would just beep your programs on and you would retrieve them like that. That sort of was very cumbersome. So I invested in a teletype, which costed 25 guilders at that time and I punched tapes for the programs in 2K. So that means you had like large stacks of tape for just programs you would download. The next nice thing was is that static RAM appeared and you could back it up with a battery and that would last for a long time so I could back up programs of 2K. You have to imagine that a, an editor which we just wrote ourselves was less than 2K and you could, you could actually do something useful with it. Please tell that to Emacs or Firefox or whatever is like a gig of resident memory at the moment. I also ported CPM uh, to that system when I, I, I got hold of a floppy. And it was actually a breadboarded system, so it was just with a soldering gun, we fixed everything together. Then I started working at the university. First I studied at the university and then I got a, a sort of job in assembling boards. And the group where I was working was together with the Nijmegen uh, IT, uh, IT department actually building VME Unix systems. You have to imagine that was about system three time. And disks were, well, they were about this clunky and heavy. And the only thing that came out of a disk was analog signal. So you'd have to write or, or actually in hardware build all the signals to actually clock the data on the disk and off the disk and, and do the checksums and everything really by hand. So the whole board you see there in the middle is one of those boards. It's about this size and it's all uh, wire wrapped. So that means every connection instead of on a PCB drawn is actually with a gun, you just wrap it. Plenty of mistakes. 
and it, it's a lot of work. And usually one of, out of two uh, actually really worked. And the other thing is you, once you've built that, then you had to drive your, uh, uh, write your own drivers for it. So any mistakes you made in the board, you got back actually again in writing the software. So later on, the group got Apollo domain systems, which were a sort of Linux, uh, Unix type systems, but you could switch them from Sys3 to BSD uh, on the fly, but they were not quite uh, Unix type because they, at the, the user API level, it looked like Unix, but underneath anything was Apollo domain OS. And that meant that, for instance, PIDs got reused, or you could have two programs with the same PID. Well, imagine that you have a, a Unix program that does want to do anything with its own state, and you have two programs with the same PID, how much trouble that you would get. So porting those programs over was already where, where it sort of started uh, in the programming experience. They had one really nice thing. They were clustered in uh, a token ring network, and you could actually DMA from one processor over the token ring network directly to a different disk. So the infrastructure underneath the OS for, for disks and things like that was completely different from anything we know now, uh, which again had its advantages and its disadvantages because, because of direct DMA, you could really kill one of the remote disks if any of the processes really escaped from uh, doing reasonable things. I tinkered a lot at home. Uh, here at the bottom slide is uh, one of my first experiments. I think it was with uh, ZFS. And I think the first PC I bought was somewhere around like 9080. And uh, it was a 386 with uh, one floppy. And uh, the, the first hard disk was 5 meg. Costed 1,400 guilders, something. And you have to go in to, into the BIOS and actually, with the debugger, call one of the setup routines on the disk to actually get the disk formatted. Uh, really weird stuff that now all of, all of is sort of arranged in, uh, in proper OSs. In 93, like I said, we started EIA. EIA started relatively simple. You have to imagine that uh, in Eindhoven, everybody was telling us, well, why would you want to give internet access to just about anybody? It's something we can now hardly imagine that uh, anybody ever thought of that. We had a business plan that suggested that in Eindhoven, we would get about 300 subscribers. And I worked at the Nutlab at that time. And the Nutlab worked like about 2,000 people, more or less. And we thought, well, if we have 300, in the first year, we'll be very happy. So what did we, did we do? We bought a 486, connected uh, two small gig uh, disks over SCSI, had a really crappy uh, uh, SCSI driver uh, from Adaptec uh, on an uh, ESA slot on it. No performance at all, but it sort of did its work. I see a lot of people nodding all of a sudden. So we're now getting a familiar state, I guess. So. But you have to imagine, it's this 486, 16 meg on board, 3 gig of, of disk space, and we were running about, I think at the max, 60 lo uh, console logs in. It ran a DEIA website, it ran a new server, uh, all these things we were sort of, as, as command line freaks, used of running on, on a Unix system anywhere proper we would run that uh, for about 100 clients. And I'm not going to say finger in the nose, but relatively easy. And then uh, one of our friends, Arian, uh, designed uh, uh, counters and all kinds of papers. And all of a sudden, Eindhoven, uh, uh, the newspaper in Eindhoven, they, they found out that it was nice to have a website. And they were the first to actually put things of the Tour de France, like stats and pictures and all these kinds of things on our poor little server. Uh, we needed to buy a second one really fast after that. But that's more or less how, uh, uh, in natural growth. Uh, I think the picture on the right is like uh, 9080, just before we actually moved over to our own building with 
800 square meter data center uh, in the floor. But here uh, you can still see some of the setup that we had for the new server. And I'm, I'm, I'll probably see more people nodding. Do you still know Mac, Mac store disks? The four gigabyte uh, disks. Uh, they would have a lifespan of about three weeks as new server. And they would crap out uh, four at the same time. Uh, RAID doesn't cover that. So you'd, you would trash the whole news. Uh, and that would, would be about 100 gig. You would trash it. And then fortunately, the university was just around the corner. And we'd, we could actually reload the whole image from the university again. And with over 10 uh, megabit ethernet, uh, thin ethernet network, we would reload the whole new server again. Those days. So really early on, I already didn't like rates because the, all these squishy disks were in a, in, a, in a hardware rate installation that nah, it gave us more trouble than it actually saved us time. Uh, who here is using rates? Who dares to say this after this remark? <laughs> no, okay. Rate is that, and why is rate that? It's, it has to do with the graph underneath that. If you go to RAID 5, we now start using disks so big that the MBTF of those disks is larger than most of the uh, RAID rebuild times for those disks. So you replace a disk, you stick it in, and you s tell the RAID controller to rebuild it, and it has to read all disks in the RAID again to actually recreate the parity and all these things there's a big fat chance that you will get another error before your rate is rebuilt. So that doesn't really, really help you at, at that point. So they've invented rate 6 and rate 7.3 to go over all these things. But as you can still see, there's even on the green line, there's a fair chance that you will not be able to rebuild your rate problem. So some invented for that uh, ZFS. They called some of the redundancy solutions also rates. To show, so you have Z rate 1, Z rate 2, Z rate 3. Uh, but they also included in the system they made actually on disk per sector checksums to actually make sure that what you read of the disk is that you can automatically verify that that is correct. So there's a whole restore system well, that creates a bigger chance of getting the data back that you actually put on it. And that's what storage is all about, right? Otherwise, it's a gigo, garbage in, garbage out. Or true data in, still garbage out. Um, I was one of the first to actually uh, start running it at home in 2006. Um, I think I started with like four or six disks. All my data is now at the moment on it. Everything migrated. And the only thing I do is I upgrade disks. I replace disks. I replace the motherboard. I replace controllers. But I just keep rolling on my data. My data actually has never left that system. And that is one of the things that is sort of plaguing us uh, at the modern day. We're generating so much data that how are you going to upgrade a system that contains, well, I have 32T at home. If I put a system next to it over a 10 gigabit link, it'll still take a few days to actually transfer or R-sync or whatever you want to think, one system to the next. I've been working on the, on, on the system from where I was migrating because I still need to work. So I have to re-R-sync, 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 and finally, after a week, I can sort of switch off the old system and go forward to the new system. That has created in the big data industry the idea of that a storage system is going to be perpetual. It's never going to die, and the data has always has to be there. Now, there's only one way you can do that uh, if you build in duplication or tolerance or failovers or things. The solution in FreeBSD was called HAST, High Availability. 
uh, storage. And that goes for, uh, uh, that exists of two nodes, where the second node is actually sort of the backup node for the first one. Turns out that if you work on that and you fall over to the backup node because the first node went offline for what reason or one another, you end up with a sort of split brain because if you didn't switch off the node, but it sort of went in a blue skyish type problem where it, it was there, but it wasn't there, but it was still doing things, uh, you'd end up with a split brain because data on the left side and on the right side weren't compatible anymore, and you can't fuse the two systems together in one system again. So anything with a single replication is actually asking for failure because if problems occur, you will never be able to tell if the data on the, the operational system actually is completely coherent with the system that you were running the backups to. So that's why I say it's not for the faint of heart. If you need to do a reconstruction on that, get your diffs out and uh, finds and things like that. I've been in that situation and I decided that that wasn't my case. So I started looking into the industry. One of the things we found uh, is Scale.io. It's, uh, it's a quite expensive product. It's now owned by EMC. Sorry? Sorry? Scale.io, it's, it's a great product. It, it, it supports volumes. Uh, it is sort of in the two replica section, and, they, and I haven't seen proof, but they sort of claim that you can't get a split brain solution like in the Hust situation. But it's also very, fairly expensive. They wanted to have it's priced per terabyte of storage, and the amount was so much that I could more or less fund another company and have some engineers work on it and uh, do, do the same thing just more or less for fun, which, well, sometimes we do that, sometimes we don't. So we, we looked a little bit further, and then you come into the, the open source type of things. Gluster was one of the things we actually used at Ethion to do video distribution. And we wanted to run a, a cloud type -ish company, so we looked at what kind of products were supported by OpenStack, and one of them is, uh, is Ceph. So Ceph is built on Rados, and Rados is actually the, the, the library on, on which the, uh, the applications can do their thing. And Rados stands for redundant Right. I, I'm using it, but I don't know even. I don't even know the acronym. The red, a reliable autonomous distributed object store. Thank you very much. And the idea is, is that with this you can either scale up or scale out. And what do I mean with that? If I have my ZFS solution, I've grown it from. Uh, from in size by actually adding in the same cabinet or in the same process locality stack more disks. So that means you just have one stack of uh, disks connected to the same uh, cabinet. If that cabinet dies, you're still out of disks. Uh, scale out means that you will replicate in multiple racks or multiple servers. And the idea with Rados is, is you can do both. You, you can create a large volume of OSDs, they are called. Each OSD manages one disk. And those OSDs together actually form your redundant uh, storage device. And there's a library and uh, a lot of algorithms on it that will supply you with a general view of that data. And the idea is, is that if one of the OSDs in that whole cluster dies, that the cluster doesn't really care because there's enough redundancy in the cluster. Most of the times it's three times replicated that we can rebuild that same OSD. So if, if anything weird happens to an OSD, the idea is not to repair it, but actually yank the disk, insert, or well, first clean the disk, 
insert it back again if, if it's a, a software malfunction or whatever. Just insert the disk again, and it'll rebuild the tree. So that's completely different from going in with FSCK or whatever to actually try and repair the, the problems that are created. On, on top of that, there's a few uh, application variations that are interesting. You can either directly access the library and do all kinds of nice things. There's a gateway, because it's an object store that you can, with S3 or all kinds of other object store access methods, you want to go there. That's the Rados gateway. And the two things I was actually interested in is RBD, which means uh, a remote block device or a redundant block device, or CephFS. CephFS is relatively new, so that it is a file system that actually runs on that object store. And uh, I was interested in RBD because RBD are block devices, so you can stick them either in the, the, the Linux variation, which is KVM, which is actually done in OpenStack. So KVM runs on an RBD, which gets its data from a Ceph cluster. And I wanted to do the same at the FreeBSD end, which is there, the virtualizer is, is Beehive. And we create a, a geom disk device that we either stick in Beehive or actually mount on uh, the domain uh, zero uh, platform so that you can still use those disks. Who here is FreeBSD aware? Uh, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. OK, so some of you will actually understand some of the terms that I'm, uh, I'm using. So how's that, how does that work? It's, uh, underneath is the cluster, so it's the OSDs and the monitors. The idea is that the monitors are uh, not involved in the process of delivering your data. If you want to have data, you directly go to the OSDs. Now, there's somebody who's written a complete PhD on the algorithms to actually do that. So once you have a request, like in the client over here, you go to the primary OSD, which is explained to you by the algorithm. And the primary OSD accepts the data, writes it to its own store, and asks the two other OSDs that replicate your data to actually do the same, report back. And only once that is really reported back to the primary OSD, the primary OSD will inform the client that the data is stable in storage. There's a lot of caching and SSD and all kinds of other stuff uh, in those small error, error, because you'll understand that if you don't do that, it'll take forever just to do one right. So there's, there's, there's a lot of mumbo jumbo underneath, but in the end, it'll still work pretty nicely. And then the idea is, is that uh, in, the, in the physical model, you have the, 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 scale, in, the scale up and scale out uh, thing. You have a lot of servers here with the regular commodity stuff. We actually use Supermicros for that, the cheapest uh, stuff that you can get. Uh, here it runs Linux. Uh, there's a Ceph intermediate layer that ends up at, uh, as a storage cluster. And there you have your clients accessing it. Now, if you want to grow or you want to migrate, it's relatively simple. If you want to grow, you can look in the servers, whether there's more capacity, if there's more base, you just stick in more disks. But if that's full or you want to build some redundancy, you can just keep on scaling um, more disks in new servers or even complete racks with servers for that. And the algorithm, the smart algorithm, redistributes the data. And you can still have a redundant store. You, if you want to do some maintenance on server 4, you just switch it off. You can sign out the OSDs, and then data will uh, redistribute. And you work on it. You come back, switch uh, server 4 back on. You, uh, the, the software will automatically announce that it's available again. Data will flow back in again. And nobody on the top level in the clients actually knows that something is happening in the, in the cluster network. Other fascinating thing is, is because of the Ceph storage cluster interface, you can have uh, automatic migration. 
in that you can have two clients access the same raw disk device as long as they act in coherence, but they, they will get the same uh, view on that block device. So if you want to migrate the KVM from one side to, the, to, to another server, it can still do the same request uh, at the storage cluster because the storage cluster more or less guarantees that data is persistent and uh, completely in sync for both of the, the, the views. And if you're migrating, you actually only have one process that actually does the same reads and writes. So that, those are a few interesting things to actually start using it in, for instance, OpenStack, where you can migrate clients and things like that. Uh, why did I want to port it to FreeBSD? Well, given the history I've sort of the, I've introduced you to where I'm coming from, uh, it is the next best thing for FreeBSD, I think, to actually glue onto ZFS. I think ZFS is really great. Uh, there's uh, on Linux, there's uh, ZFS for Linux. A lot of people are using it. I, I would guess some people are also using ButterFS, but uh, if I st still see XFS or X4 or other really, really painful things, I think, well, hey, grow up. It's uh, 2017. Use a proper uh, file system, I, uh, which does the modern kinds of things. I mean, snapshots making in ZFS is like one or two seconds, and then you've got a snapshot. Uh, hmm? Creating is more or less free, but it takes two seconds with a command line. Okay, so as I foresee that uh, FreeBSD needs to scale out, I started porting on this, and I've been porting for about two years now, and it wasn't even very difficult, but it's, in the end, it's a lot of work. Uh, I started on 10.0 uh, with uh, the new CLang compiler, which still has some really nice twerks. And it turns out CLang is much more stricter than most of the GNU compilers. So I think the first six months I was just fixing, let's say, code variations that were accepted by GNU, but CLang really thought that were a boo-boo. There's nothing more boring than that. Trust me, it's, it is really just like uh, type promotions and things like that, and you have to go into a library to f really find out why a type isn't promotable. Lach. You don't want to do that, trust me. Uh, fortunately, uh, at the GNU side, uh, they've moved up uh, a little bit, so GNU has more error reporting and warnings. So they've started cleaning up their own code at the, at the, at the Ceph community. And also, we moved to 3.8, 4.0, and I think in 12.0, we now have 5.1 uh, CLang, which is way much more pleasant than the 3.4 I actually started with. Uh, fun part of FreeBSD is it's got a huge amount of packages, and uh, talking to the people that actually port Ceph, to uh, build Ceph on Linux, and I see the problems they have with all the packages in Debian, which are more than f five years old. Uh, they still have to adhere to CentOS 7.0 with Python packages from uh, the medieval times. Uh, I think we're pretty blessed in free breeze the time. I see a lot of people nagging in the way the packages are managed, but seeing the other side on, on the enormous amount of time it, it actually consumes to make sure that Ceph is buildable on all distros uh, with all the packages. Uh, I'm glad I'm a FreeBSD user for that. 31 packages are needed to actually uh, build and use uh, Ceph, which is not all that much, but if you drill down the tree, if I just build uh, Ceph, I end up with 500 dependencies on all kinds of packages. So it's quite a kitchen sink. Well, like I said, compiler warnings are abundant. Uh, and this is just some flexibility built into C++. You can have a class, but if you don't feel like using a class, you can also call it a struct. 
but then the compiler starts nagging to you about hey, if you use the class or the struct in the other way around. And if you mismatch them in the headers versus using them in the actual C files, it even starts barfing even more. I think the first run on C lang generated about 10,000 lines of warning. Most of them I just shut off. So uh, <laughs> no warnings, no warnings. The other thing is really funny because uh, this is this package with, with tens of thousands of files, and it compiles, and it builds, and it runs. So seemingly, it's, it, it's fairly OK. But the way things are working is not the way the things work on FreeBSD. Like, for instance, some files do include the required files on Linux. Some files don't. And then all of a sudden, I'm missing structures. So the whole code is sort of a mismatch with if devs, if it's FreeBSD, please do include the rpar.h files because we need certain structures. Linux does it by itself. Sometimes it's handy, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there's also something like a, a turf war, I, I, I would call it. Like uh, there's OD-sync in Linux. We as regular Unix users call that OSync and all kinds of things that are sort of run amok. One of those is ain't no data. That's the Linux variant, and FreeBSD, we call that you know, utter, or there's, no, uh, there's an error on the attribute, which is used with get attribute uh, calls. That's not an easy one, but I'll get back on the, on the next sheet. And then there's Mismatching calls because uh, FreeBSD called a lot of the uh, functions that are not supported by POSIX but are still available and have their counter match. They call them underscore NP, as in non -pos POSIX. You, you have to find them, you have to rewrite them, and then you have to hope that the, at the actual API interface actually does the same as the one at the counterpart. Most of the time it is. But once in a while, if you get a crash, it's usually because one of the parameters does something different. And then there's also things that uh, if in Linux you want to find out what the name of a thread is, you can set the name in BSD on a thread. But if you want to get the name back, there's no call on FreeBSD for that. If you want to do that, you have to go into VM, actually through slash dev KVM, and actually start digging out your stack infrastructure to find actually the name that is stored in there. So I asked, why is there no call? Well, you know the code. Write it. <laughs> yes, sure, sure. And there's plenty of answers on things like that. So the simple thing, um, the Eno data, Eno attribute, that was something that bit me about a, th a dozen times, and every, every time somebody changes the code or adds a new uh, file, I, I usually get the same problem again. What's the problem? It's on the bottom line. If you use Boost, and Boost is a sort of upgraded uh, C++ library to do most of the things in C++, it defines Eno data is 99.19. And Actually, on uh, FreeBSD, uh, Eno data is like 67, and on Linux, is, uh, e uh, Eno data is 86. So there's already three types of values. And one way or the other, we have to come in unison on what the answer is, because otherwise, weird things start happening. And the while loop over there is really, really, really something of a sort of deadlock trap. Because if you start comparing with the wrong Eno data, like for instance 9919, and e, the, the function call actually returns e, Eno attribute, which is 86, then that is never going to match. Now, um, why is that a problem? Because a lot of the boost files get included, included before I actually get the possibility to set Eno data. So every time something is created in new and boost files are included before uh, I get a chance to in include my compat header, 
I have to find out what they actually did and, and go back in. Once I found out that that was a typical problem, it's not that difficult, but in this whole pile of, uh, of bits, it was quite some work. Something more tricky, uh, people that actually listen in on FreeBSD lists know about the expensiveness of getting real correct time info on FreeBSD uh, because we really want to deliver the accurate date and time into almost nanoseconds, more or, more or less. And the argument is on Linux, they sort of skimp the process and they give fairly accurate times and things like that. So. I can change uh, the calls of the functions, but then still, is the function that is used there actually, does it require relative time, relative precise time, or really, really, really accurate time? And if I translate something which needs to be more or less accurate by the FreeBSD counterpart that actually is horrendously expensive, but very precise, I've sort of killed uh, the, the, the throughput of the process. So that took a lot of benchmarking to see whether things were right and also asking people that actually wrote the code to, to ask them, what are you doing with the clock over there? Uh, then the code is baffled with Linux optimi uh, optimizations. One minute? Yeah. Oh my god, I've, I've got about 50 slides and a demonstration. Okay, okay, well, you go for the next one then. <laughs> really bad. Um, we go to the demo. Let's go. Okay, the final demo actually is here. I had more, but we'll just show this one. I'm going to create a Beehive instance. Oh, I need to be... You, super user, don't do this. Always make sure that sudo requires a password. Otherwise, my security friends over there get annoyed. Uh, and then... And uh, I need to start an instance. Or actually, first I need to load an image. Uh, oh, right. I sort of shortcutted uh, some of the things. I first have to create a pool, of course. That happens when somebody really messes up your presentation by telling you only have one more minute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can't I rent a room for another half hour or something like that? I don't know all the commands by heart, actually, to be honest. So I need to create a pool. So a pool is more or less the, the storage unit within Ceph. And on that uh, pool, I actually are go am going to use uh, an image stick memory, in, uh, which is in FreeBSD. I think only downloading this more or less takes a minute. Uh, it's a crappy server at home, it's like... So th this image is, is going to be the mem memory stick image, and I am actually going to glue that into what is called a G-gate uh, device. And uh, here... And what you now have here in, in slash dev is this G-gate device. And it's a memory stick, so it was G-parted already. So all of a sudden, I have this complete memory stick just as a regular device, which I would be able to mount. 
Uh, let's see. That, no. that device I'm going to load into Beehive. Ik zat nog in les. Les doesn't work. Zou ik over twee minuten klaar kunnen zijn? Uh, uh, jij bent de baas, dus uh, <laughs> ik ben over twee minuten klaar. Uh, so this was Gate zero. We're going to load this into the uh, Beehive uh, memory. Oh, I need to create a disk also to actually do some work on. We'll just skip that. I'll just show you that it really, really boots. Uh, I see uh, HD dot dash G gate. Gate zero. This is expected. And now I can install actually FreeBSD. Now the, I all, what I also wanted to do, but I don't have uh, any more minutes from Ed, is that I would actually create another disk just by zeroing out an image, actually loading that also in the RBD, and then mount that as a second disk, and now from this install prompt, actually start installing on the, on, the, on, the, on the second disk. Once you've done that, you can just reboot your VM with the, just that disk running, and then you have redundant store at the back end. I, I was also going to give performance indications and all kinds of other things, but Ed is going to shoot me. So anyway, thanks a lot for your talk. It's too bad that we couldn't see all of it. Uh, let's give a big round of applause for Willem Jan. <laughs> On behalf of the organization, I would also like to give this small present. Ah, Stromfafels, yeah. really, thanks. Yeah, so unfortunately there's no more time for any questions, uh, <laughs> but you can have a chat with Willem Jan after the talk or later today. Yeah, um, please do. Thanks yes. very much. So the next talk is going to start in three or four minutes. Run! <laughs> <laughs>